So welcome to evening three. Uh, we're halfway, halfway through this introduction, and it just does not do justice to the depth of this work. And I, I wanted to give you guys 10 key concepts that are in the course. However, as, as I was feeling into what would be the best 10 key concepts, the guidance that I received was actually to give you guys a lot more than 10 key concepts, and it was more to give you an, an, a, a lot more in-depth look at the thought process when you're thinking with your ego, and then those thoughts that are when you're thinking with God. When we align with God, the thinking is very different than when we align with our ego. And then I'm gonna take you through a, a lesson that is going to help you see the thought process of the ego in action and the thought process of a, us choosing to align with, with truth. And the lesson is going to simplify, or the way that I present it is going to simplify that specific lessons, which is lesson number 110. And it's the lesson that says, I am as God created me. So I'm going to start with taking you through the thoughts that our ego uses, then I'm going to uh, shift to the lesson, and then I'm gonna take you back to the thoughts when we align with God, and then we'll shift back to the lesson. Because I want you to see how, when you have a good understanding of what um, the, the key concepts in the course, and every single concept that I'm gonna share with you is also a title for a lesson. So this sheet, if you see where there are numbers, from one to 15 here, the numbers that are on the left side are the lesson number, so that you guys can reference that later on. But when we pay attention to how all of this lines up, how it works, when you put it together, I think it's a lot more powerful. I think you're gonna have some fun um, being able to, to have more of an applicable use of, of the lessons today in, in this segment of the introduction. But before we go to that, I wanted to ask to see if anybody has any comments or questions from the last couple of weeks that may be with you so that we can release those from your mind and then <coughs> empty out and be present to what we're going to do today. Yes. The forgiveness, when you talked about forgiveness and how we hold on to forgiveness for years and how it hides in our chakras, um, could you explain that a little bit more? So your question about being able to release that energy that gets pent up in our chakras because of, of all of the, it's the fear, it's the ego-based energy that is held. Let me go through this presentation and then let me know if that helps you release. Because I can tell you it's very simple. Stop thinking the thoughts that you're thinking that make you feel bad. However, it's not so simple because until you sit with it and you acknowledge that those thoughts are there for a reason, that energy has been held for a reason, you're going to see exactly why then the release happens with an awareness that allows you to realize not only why you held on to that, but why you want to release it. Mm -hmm. So if at the end of this presentation you don't feel clear about that, let's revisit that. Um, but it's a, it's a perfect question because that's what, we're, that's what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to release all that is past that does not serve us anymore. So for those who are new tonight, thank you for joining us. Um, and we're gonna have a very, very simple format. I'm gonna do this presentation, and after the presentation, you're welcome to ask questions. And Penelope has put a microphone over there that when you have a question, if you'll ask it over there so it's nice and clear. I'm gonna start with the, the lessons that are going to help us better understand the human mind. So we're gonna start off with, let me pull this. So lesson, Again, this is a number for the lesson. Lesson number five says, I am never upset for the reason I think. And the reason I am never upset for what is in my mind is because what is in my mind is always old information. And I don't know if you remember when we talked last time or the last two times, but the ego mind operates out of self-protection. So anything that has been recorded in the mind of the ego, this is, this is the information that takes care of, of our need for self-protection. 
the reason we are we believe we're upset with somebody out there is because actually we don't really know why we're upset we are just projecting the upset outside of us and for this to make sense we have to understand that we are creating our experience of life the course is very clear we are in the mind of God perfectly held in paradise powerful as can be deciding to block paradise we're deciding to not enjoy what God has given us because we've decided that we're going to do it our own way. Like a two-year-old throwing a tantrum, I'm going to do it all by myself. And when we do it all by ourselves, we feel very small and insignificant, especially if we're one of eight billion people on the planet. And when we compare ourselves to the size of, of maybe some animals, and we compare ourselves to the size of um, you know, maybe a mountain, we compare ourselves to the size of the planet or the universe, we feel very insignificant because we don't realize that we are one with all of that. So when we t make the decision, because we can, we are powerful beyond measure, we've been given free will, Free will means I will decide whatever it is that I want to decide. And God in its infinite love with no conditions, unconditional, has said, you can do that all you want. But the joke is that we've never left paradise. We have just put blinders on and we can't see paradise. Why? Because I am, I am upset about things that are, I really don't understand. I'm upset because I'm, I'm trying to perceive paradise through a filter. And that filter, which is lesson number seven, tells us it's because we only see the past. So not only is something happening, and, I, and, and I'm upset with it, I don't know why, but it's also because I'm looking at it from the past, and the past information that we operate from is primarily the information that we have held on to by the time we're 10 years old. So I want you to think of your mind as a recorder. And when we are children, especially when we're pre-verbal, we don't know words, we, don't ha we haven't put meaning to things, we just experience energy. Feels good, I'm, I'm open, I can be myself. Feels bad, I'm contracted, I'm in protection. So we need to understand that a child expresses itself fully because it feels safe, suppresses itself, because it doesn't feel safe. So our chakras are those energy centers that either we're operating freely or we're being suppressed. So this is why we have to do the work of release because we've been holding in things. So when we don't have words, we energetically hold on to it. But whether it's with words or energy, when we hold it in, it's because we do not feel safe. Keep that in mind. Our ego is the thoughts that we have that tell us that I'm not safe to be myself. And the reason I feel like I'm not safe to be myself is because I've compared myself to everything else. And I see a lot of people out there, especially when I'm little, they're bigger than I am. There, there begins to form an idea that who I am is not safe in this world. So I'm always projecting outward things that are really not the actual reason of what's happening because I cannot see what's out there because I am operating from a, a an immature childish perspective because everything that I see is always based on the past when I'm operating from my ego. Lesson number 15 tells us that our thoughts are images that we have made. So I am projecting always my mind is is the mind of God and we know that even in traditional religion, we hear things like, in the beginning was the word, which really translated from its original source, it's that in the beginning was an idea. In the beginning was a thought. In the beginning, the mind that is creative has an idea. No different than a child or you when you are daydreaming, an idea comes into your mind. You know, where do you think Einstein's formulas came to him when he didn't know them before they came to him? Where does a songwriter get a song when they, it's not a song that was in their head before that? Or a poem is written that was never written before. Where is that emanating from? If you stop to question, where does something original come from when it wasn't in the mind of the one who shares it with us? 
it must have come from somewhere. So when we begin to realize that my thoughts are images that I have made, and I am operating with only the past, we are projecting out there the things that are in our mind for us to make a decision. Am I gonna see it from my childish perspective? Which is why I am upset, but it's not for a valid reason. I'm upset because I'm, I'm looking at it from my immature perspective, which means I'm scared, I need to protect myself. Or am I going to be seeing what God has imagined that is there but I can't see it when I've got my blinders on. Th does that make sense? So we're looking at filters that we put on, we pick them up as children, that blocks us from seeing clearly what God has created. And then you look at the next lesson, which is lesson number 10, and it says, I have no neutral thoughts. Now this should make perfect sense, because if you're scared, your thoughts are not gonna be neutral. Even if you're happy, they're not neutral. When you're happy, your thoughts are, this is good, this is right, this is peaceful, this is okay, this is safe. When you're unhappy, your thoughts are, this is, this is scary, this is unsafe, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening. So the human thoughts always operate in polarity, in duality, right and wrong, good or bad, uh, you and me, um, us versus them, it's always operating with two sides, where truth is always singular. You cannot divide truth. You cannot divide anything that is true because it doesn't have polarity. But the ego can perceive truth from one perspective, call it right, from the other perspective, call it wrong. So once you realize that you have no neutral thoughts, that's the beginning of self-awareness because that's when you begin to realize, oh, if I don't like what I'm thinking, if I'm not enjoying this experience, let me look at how I'm perceiving it. And then of course you will begin to realize that you're the one projecting that out. And then eventually you begin to understand that it's coming from your past, which is why we misperceive because we perceive from our vantage point and from the ego, it is always to keep me safe. It doesn't care about anybody else. <laughs> Not at all. And then we go on to lesson 21, which says, I am determined to see things differently. So you begin to have self-awareness of, okay, in my mind are two ways of perceiving things, good and bad. At the beginning of the journey, that's typically where we start. I have good and bad thoughts, positive and negative thoughts. And then we go to the place of deciding, well, I wanna see things differently because what I'm experiencing keeps repeating and it keeps repeating and I don't like how it's happening so I want to do it differently which is why you can't solve a problem with the same mind that that created it as Einstein said so when we become self-aware we begin to come out of our way of looking at things and we begin to open up to there's got to be another way and then we study books or we go to different places. Um, many of us on our spiritual journey, we start off at one type of teaching in the home or maybe no, no spiritual teaching in the home. And then we venture and try something else. Because I would imagine, you know, by a show of hands, how many of you started off with one type of religious upbringing and then have ended up trying something different? Yeah. So when we begin to question, when we begin to become self-aware, this is the, the, the self that we are is becoming aware of what's in our mind and now we're beginning to not agree with it. We may not be ready to say my thinking is wrong thinking, which the Course tells us we have right mind and wrong mind. We've got right thought system and a wrong thought system. We may not be ready to call ourselves wrong, but we're ready to question. That is a very important, necessary step, which actually shows a lot of maturity. Really, really key when you are willing to question your own thoughts. Then from that, we're gonna move on to lesson 24, which says, I do not perceive my own best interest. So now we begin to piece together, okay, I'm looking at things from the past and I'm, not ups you know, I'm upset for uh, reasons that are, that are not accurate. Um, I don't have neutral thoughts, but I really wanna see. And now I wanna see things differently because I keep creating my own suffering. So when we become more mature, we realize if I'm suffering, then clearly I am suffering. I'm not perceiving my own best interest. That takes us even further out 
even uh, begins to expand us even more outside of what our mind wants to be right about, then lesson 25 tells us that I don't know what anything is for. And the reason I don't know what anything is for is because while I'm still trying to figure out what's going on inside of me, I'm not quite prepared to look at what's outside of me. Does that make sense? I know for me, the beginning of the journey was I, I was going inside to figure out why am I suffering? Yeah. And it's not until we get comfortable with, with realizing that we can change what's going on inside that we can even begin to perceive our own best interest. But this, this has an even more profound meaning as, as we continue. Then the next lesson is 31. I am not a victim of the world I see. So when we begin to realize, to truly, truly realize that we are projecting the world. So we go back to this one. My thoughts are images that I have made. And we can begin to really take responsibility that what is showing up, I have projected it. Now, can I possibly be a victim of it? If it's coming from my mind, how can I be victimized by my projection? Th does that make sense? This in the beginning is a very uncomfortable um, place to be in. What, I'm not a victim of what they did to me? And from that perspective, a lot of people will, will do uh, you know, traditional type therapy, maybe talk to a coach and begin to at least start the process of realizing that people did the best that they could with what they had. And it begins to create a process by which we can identify where did I begin to perceive my source of suffering. And then we typically will end up in childhood. Inevitably, that's where we're gonna go. And that's when we begin to realize that the process of forgiveness is necessary, which is for me to claim my power back, I cannot be a victim of anything. This statement, I am not a victim of the world I see becomes extremely liberating when we're ready to really own our power. But while we're still in the, in the space of looking at how we got disempowered, the I am not a victim of the world I see can be scary. And for many people, they tend to leave the course when they get to about that lesson. And as you notice, the lesson is number 31 out of 365. So most people, will, when they're not ready, will run away from the course because the course is saying, nobody out there hurt you. And that will either make you say, the ego mind will go into total, complete lockdown. I am not gonna hear of any of this nonsense. Or the mind comes to a place of realizing, yes, I'm coming, I'm, I'm about to wake up. There's something magical, miraculous that's about to happen because when we stop seeing the outside as having power over us, we actually get to go inside and begin to claim our own power. Isn't that exciting? Yes.